Howdy folks! Today, we'll be talking about heart failure and hopefully providing you a framework to categorize the different causes. Let's first talk about the basics of heart failure. The main problem with heart failure is a decreased cardiac output. Now, when thinking about heart failure in terms of diastolic heart failure versus systolic heart failure, in diastolic heart failure, you have impaired filling of the ventricle, which is going to lead to decreased stroke volume, leading to a decreased cardiac output. Now, in systolic heart failure, you have impaired contraction of your ventricle, which is also going to lead to a decreased stroke volume, leading to a decreased cardiac output, which again is the main hallmark of heart failure. Now, before I get into the details of diastolic versus systolic, I think it's really important to review the frank starting relationship, as that really relates the filling of the ventricle to the stroke volume. So let's move to the other side. So here, we have the frank starting relationship. On the y-axis here, we have the stroke volume. On the x-axis here, we have the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. That is a doozy. Think of it kind of as the amount of filling you get in the ventricle. And the basic idea here is that as you get more filling in the ventricle, your stroke volume will go up. Now that kind of makes intuitive sense. If you fill the ventricle with more blood, the heart's going to want to pump out more blood, right? So that overall relationship is fairly intuitive. Now this black curve here, represents the normal curve in a healthy adult. Now this purple curve here represents the heart failure curve. What this means is that the same level of filling, you're just gonna be pumping out less blood. So you have heart failure, you have a decreased cardiac output. Now let's review the three main factors that determine the stroke volume of an individual. The preload, the contractility, and the afterload. The preload basically is the amount of filling you get of the ventricle. As you mentioned earlier, you basically get increased preload as you go down this x-axis. So as you fill the ventricle more, it's going to want to pump out more. The next factor is the contractility. The contractility is the intrinsic capability of the heart muscle to pump. You can think of it kind of as the strength of the heart. High contractility means it can pump really hard. Low contractility means it's not going to pump as hard. And as you might imagine, increased contractility is going to increase your stroke volume. So if you get a decrease in contractility, as you do in certain kinds of heart failure, you can get a decrease in stroke volume. Finally, we have afterload. Afterload is essentially the pressure that the heart has to pump against in order to pump blood out. This is usually the pressure in the aorta. Now, if you have increased afterload, that makes it harder for the ventricle to pump blood against it, so you get a decreased stroke volume. You can imagine if you have a resistance to something, it's harder to push against it. So you're going to get decreased stroke volume when you have a higher afterload. So it's important to recognize preload contract healthy and afterload, and how they affect stroke volume, because these three mechanisms relate a lot to the various kinds of heart failure we're going to be discussing. Before we talk about specific causes of diastolic and systolic heart failure, let's first review the concept of the ejection fraction. In diastolic heart failures, we see a normal ejection fraction, whereas in systolic heart failures, we see a decreased ejection fraction. Let's take a look at the equation for ejection fraction on the other side of the board first. So here we have the equation for ejection fraction. Uh, ejection fraction is often abbreviated as EF. This is equal to the stroke volume over the total ventricular volume. We can further rewrite this equation as the end diastolic volume, or the amount of blood in your ventricle at the end of diastole, right before you contract, minus the end systolic volume, basically the amount of blood left in your ventricle after you contract. And this is divided by the end diastolic volume here. The difference between the amount of blood you had in your ventricle before and after contraction represents the amount of blood you lost during contraction, right? So that's basically your stroke volume. And this is divided again by the amount of blood you had in your ventricle right before contraction. That's your total ventricular volume before you contract. So this is basically saying how much blood you pump out versus how much blood did you have in your left ventricle to begin with uh, before contraction. So this is sort of an intuitive equation as to how much blood you pump out versus how much you actually had. So that's your ejection fraction. So let's move over again. So we said in diastolic heart failure, the main problem is an impairment of filling. Because you have less filling, you'll have a decreased end diastolic volume, and you'll also have a decreased stroke volume as, as a result of that due to the frank starting mechanism we talked about earlier because preload is a major determinant um, of your stroke volume. So because both the numerator and the denominator are going to drop, your ejection fraction is preserved. Let's contrast this with systolic heart failure. Now, in systolic heart failure, there shouldn't be a problem with your ventricle filling with blood. So your end diastolic volume, right, the denominator of that equation, should be the same. However, we're going to have a problem with contraction, so that's going to decrease our stroke volume. So the numerator drops, 
but the denominator remains constant, our overall ejection fraction is going to decrease. So we're going to get a decreased ejection fraction in systolic heart failure. Now, the terms diastolic and systolic heart failure are sometimes considered outdated now. Some newer sources often use heart failure with preserved ejection fraction versus heart failure with uh, decreased ejection fraction. And these are roughly correlated and synonymous with diastolic and systolic heart failures. So in different sources, you'll see them called different ways, but the overall concepts are still the same. Now, let's talk about the causes of diastolic heart failure. We see that diastolic heart failure is all about impaired filling of the ventricle, leading to that decreased cardiac output. So let's talk about some reasons why you'll have impairment of filling of your left ventricle. Let's take a look at mitral stenosis. Now, recall the mitral valve is located between your left atrium and your left ventricle. And the valve opens up and allows blood to flow from the left atrium to the ventricle during diastole, and this valve is hopefully closed shut during systole to prevent blood from going back from the ventricle into the atrium. Now, in mitral stenosis, you'll have thickening and fibrosis of the valve. And what that means is that it'll be harder for blood to go from the atrium to the ventricle during systole. Now, because of that, if it's harder for blood to go from the atrium to the ventricle, you'll have less blood traveling from the atrium to the ventricle, so you'll get impaired filling. Not because the ventricle is screwed up, but because the valves make it harder for blood to go from the atrium to the ventricle. And as a result, you'll get impaired filling, your decreased cardiac output, you have diastolic heart failure. So mitral stenosis is one cause of diastolic heart failure. Now we have a bunch of other causes of diastolic heart failure as well, and they all center around this concept of decreased compliance. You can kind of think of decreased compliance as increased stiffness of the ventricle. The basic, basic idea is that if your ventricle is more stiff, it can fill with less blood. So you're going to get a decrease in end diastolic volume, which is going to affect your ability to pump blood out because you'll have less blood there to begin with. So you'll get uh, decreased cardiac output and heart failure. So let's talk about some of the causes of why you get a decreased compliant, more stiff ventricle. So two of these causes could be aortic stenosis and hypertension. Note how these are written in purple as opposed to why the rest of the stuff in diastolic is written in blue. That's because both aortic stenosis and hypertension can also lead to systolic which we'll get to a little later. But for now, we have aortic stenosis and hypertension. Both of these disease processes will lead to an increased afterload. And as we talked about earlier, an increased afterload makes it hard for the heart to pump out blood, right? So the heart's gonna be thinking, okay, I have increased afterload, how can I adapt myself to that? The heart's gonna undergo what's called concentric left ventricular hypertrophy to adapt to that increased afterload. And it's gonna basically increase the contractility of the heart. So the heart's trying to compensate for the increased afterload by making it stronger, right? It's kind of like working out to increase its strength so it can pump against the afterload. Now that seems like a smart adaptation, right? And it does increase contractility, but the problem is that when you increase your contractility, you sacrifice your compliance. So even though you're getting stronger, you also get stiffer. So you're able to pump out plenty of blood, but you will fill, out, fill with less blood to begin with because your ventricle is now stiff. And that's going to lead to impaired filling, right? And decreased cardiac output. So just to reiterate, Aortic stenosis and hypertension will lead, when not treated, to concentric hypertrophy, which causes a decreased compliance, problem filling, and the heart failure. And there's other causes of a decreased compliance as well. We have restrictive cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which also lead to decreased compliance and then the impaired filling. In restrictive cardiomyopathy, you have a variety of disease processes like amyloidosis, hemochromatosis, etc. that basically lead to fibrosis and stiffening of the uh, ventricle itself, and that'll lead to the decreased compliance and a decreased cardiac output. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're basically born with a condition in which you do this concentric hypertrophy kind of by itself. You, your body naturally makes super hypertrophic, super strong, super stiff ventricle, and that's going to cause the decreased compliance, increased, uh, decreased cardiac output. So these aren't necessarily adaptations to an external factor, but they still lead to decreased compliance. Whereas the aortic stenosis and hypertension eventually lead to an adaptive response of concentric hypertrophy, which then leads to the decreased compliance. But the decreased compliance of the ventricle is still the central concept in all of these disease processes. Now let's finally talk about pericardial tamponade and constrictive pericarditis. Now, I want to be very clear here. These are pericardial diseases, so they do not affect the compliance of the ventricle. However, they affect the compliance of the heart as a whole when you think of the ventricle and the pericardial sac. In both these cases, you have problems in the pericardium that prevent the ventricle from expanding into the pericardial space. So basically, even though the ventricle can expand itself, 
it's surrounded by a super stiff pericardium, you can think about it. So the functional compliance is still decreased at the heart. So there's something very clear. This isn't decreased compliance of the ventricle itself, but decreased compliance of the heart. So it's a functional decrease in compliance. Anyways, in pericardial tamponade, right, you have something like fluid or blood or whatever filling the pericardial sac. And because of that, the ventricle will have, have a tough time expanding and filling when it's surrounded by a bunch of fluid, right? And the constrictive pericarditis will have a very fibrotic pericardium. And because of that fibrosis, it's also stiff. So yet again, your ventricle can expand fine, but it's surrounded by a super stiff sac. So it can't expand against the sac. So you'll still get the decreased filling and decreased cardiac output and the heart failure. So just to summarize, in diastolic heart failure, you have a problem with filling. This can be there's less blood getting into the ventricle in the first place due to mitral stenosis, or it can be an issue with the compliance of the ventricle or a functional decrease in compliance due to pericardial disease. So those are, broadly speaking, the causes of diastolic heart failure. Now, let's talk about the causes of systolic heart failure. So let's recall, the basic premise of the systolic heart failure is that there's impaired contraction leading to decreased cardiac output. Now by impaired contraction, I mean there's a decreased ability to move blood forward from the ventricle into systemic circulation during systole. And that's why it's called systolic heart failure. Now, let's go back to aerosmenosis and hypertension. Now, earlier, we talked about how these can lead to diastolic heart failure because they can cause concentric remodeling of the heart, causing more stiffening, and it makes it hard to get blood in. Now, remember, as we said earlier, aortic stenosis and hypertension, immediately, they cause an increased afterload. And as we talked about earlier, in the Frank Starling relationship, an increased afterload makes it harder to contract blood. So ignoring the whole concentric, concentric hypertrophy sort of process, aortic stenosis and hypertension themselves can lead to the increased afterload, which leads to you know, a decreased ability to get blood out of the ventricle during systole, which can cause decreased cardiac output. So these can cause systolic heart failure as well. And whether they cause diastolic and systolic will vary on the acuity, the severity, whether or not there's concentric remodeling. But the, basic, the important concept is that because these two things can lead to increased afterload, they definitely can lead to a systolic sort of heart failure. So in addition to these processes which lead to an increased afterload, we can also about, think about processes that lead to a decreased contractility, which would, of course, impair your normal contraction. Now, we have processes like myocardial infarctions and dilated cardiomyopathies that can lead to decreased contractility. So in a myocardial infarction, you have you know, a death of um, myocardial tissue. And if you have less total myocardial tissue working, you basically lose a lot of your, you know, your pumping power. So if you have some dead tissue, you lose your overall total amount of muscle that you use to pump out blood. So that makes sense that you'll have, you know, a weaker heart, so to speak. So that can lead to decreased contractility, leading to a systolic heart failure. In addition, we have dilated cardiomyopathy. In, a, in the response to a wide variety of environmental stimuli, like drugs, alcohol, different diseases, uh, your heart will remodel in ways that it increases its volume, but it decreases its contractile strength. And this will lead to decreased contractility, leading to the systolic heart failure. So in addition to these diseases, let's talk about different valvulopathies like aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation. Both of these can lead to systolic heart failure, both in their acute presentation and their chronic presentations, but they happen through different mechanisms. So first, let's think about how they work in an acute setting. Recall, the aortic valve and the mitral valve are important in preventing backflow of blood. The aortic valve prevents backflow of blood from the aorta into the ventricle, and the mitral valve prevents backflow of blood from the ventricle into the atrium. Let's imagine you completely take these valves out, so they're no longer no there. A severe regurgitation, right? Um, when, your air, when your ventricle pumps out blood into your aorta, there's nothing keeping it from going back into your ventricle. So even though you're pumping blood forward in a fine manner, a lot of it's going to come back into your ventricle. As a result, you're going to get backflow of blood, so that's basically decreased ability of your ventricle to pump blood effectively into your systemic circulation. So you can think of that sort of as a systolic kind of heart failure. And in mitral regurgitation, if you have no mitral valve, your ventricle, when it contracts, it's going to send a lot of blood back into your left atrium, actually, because that's a place of lower resistance than your aorta. So you're also going to send blood in a backwards direction, leading to black flow. So you have less blood moving forward um, to your systemic circulation, so you're going to get a decrease in cardiac output. Because cardiac output is only as important as you're able to deliver blood to your different tissues. And if the blood keeps falling back, your functional cardiac output is not really you know, that great. So in their acute presentation, aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation can lead to solid heart failure.
Now, let's talk about how they can lead to systolic heart failure in a chronic context. Now, if you have chronic aortic regurgitation or mitral regurgitation, you'll have a lot of blood filling up your left ventricle. Because of that, your left ventricle is like, hey, I have all this, this blood, I have all this volume, I'm going to do an adaptive response to accommodate all that volume. So in response to the volume overload, your left ventricle is going to undergo eccentric or eccentric left ventricular hypertrophy. What this means is that your left ventricle is going to add um, circumvirus in series. What this is going to do, it's going to expand your left ventricular volume, but it's going to sacrifice your contractility. So even though you have more volume, you have more space to accommodate all the blood from these regurgitations, you'll lose contractile strength. So this is going to lead to decreased contractility. And as I said earlier, if your heart has less intrinsic ability to pump, if it's weaker, it's going to you know, pump less blood out, so you'll get a decrease in cardiac output. So just to summarize again, in systolic heart failure, you have a problem with contracting blood forward in a, in a productive way. This can be due to high afterload, it can be due to decreased contractility, and it can also be due to backflow of blood. So I hope this video made sense and helped provide you with a framework to think about diastolic versus systolic heart failure. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and I hope to see you around.